What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and in today's episode of the Fighting Game Tutorial Series, we are going to be going over the initial setup for our online mode. So, online and networking in general is a very complex topic. Now, a lot of games that have networking were created with networking in mind. There are some things we will have to go back and adjust to get networking uh, online, including rollback, working. This series is going to support an online mode, but... Today we are only going to be going over the menus to get us to where we need to be. There is so much that goes into online that we can't possibly cover it in one episode. We need to set up menus to enter the online mode. We need to either be able to host and join games, such as these options from this pop-out menu, or we need to be able to search for a custom game or start a matchmaking session. There's a lot of things that even just get these players connected, let alone actually playing the game. On top of that, there's even different types of servers. There are dedicated servers, and there are server and client, or peer-to-peer -peer servers. Then, on top of it, we're going to be implementing rollback netcode in this project. Because of that, we have so much logic that we need to go over, so we still have a long way to go before we can fully implement online, but I wanted to get the ball rolling on this because we've been working on it for so long. So today, we're going to be going over the menu logic for the online mode. In the next online episode, we will be covering actually starting to host a game and join a game. Now, like I said, there is a lot going on to cause that to happen. It's not so simple. So we're going to do this pretty incrementally. There's going to be a lot of episodes based on online. This isn't going to be a one, two, done. This is going to be a mini episode thing. So first episode is just getting our logic set up so we can hit the host and join game buttons. After that, we'll go over some of the logic that we can use to actually start hosting and joining games and the different methods that we have to do so. So it is going to ramp up pretty quickly here, but this initial episode really is crucial because to get everything working, we need to know that we are exactly on the same page when one is hosting, one is joining, and once we get them connecting, there is still a ton of other stuff that we have to do. With all that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. So I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys who's given me all the support over the years. I really appreciate you guys. I'm very grateful. I'm so excited that we can finally start working on the online mode. And I've talked to a lot of you about different online mechanics and how we'll accomplish them. So all the support you guys have given me is very appreciated. Thank you once again. If you would like to get caught up in this series, before we start talking about online mode, then I'll link you to this playlist right here in the top right corner. You can check out everything we've accomplished in the series so far. We still have a long way to go, but we're really getting into some of the more advanced mechanics, and I'd recommend that you do get caught up on the series if you're interested in making your own fighting game. Otherwise, if you were just interested in online mode, whether it's rollback netcode or just standard online and networking logic, I'd recommend you watch this episode. If nothing else, this is the first episode where we implemented the main menu. This episode is going to be very important for today's logic because we are building on top of it and we're adding the online buttons and the pop-out menus or submenus. So we're going to be building off of it today. Now, we don't actually have to do anything in the code today because, again, we're just going to be going over the menu setup and a little bit of an introduction just verbally that I'm going to be speaking about so we can kind of plan things out in the future. So let's go to our main menu screen widget. Main menu screen widget is this one. This is my main menu, and I have all these buttons on here. I've recently just added the online button. I've also added two more buttons called host and join because we're going to need to use more than just an online mode. We now have two games, two systems that are going to be working together. And so we need one to be the host and one to be the join. Even as networking progresses in the series, there is still technically going to be some sort of host and some sort of joining, even if it's not a player. If you're connecting to a dedicated server, that server is hosting it for all the players and they will join it. So it's not exactly the same thing, but we still need to understand the concept of hosting and joining and how they actually work internally to make sure we set up our systems completely as expected. So getting started on this, let's add a new button to our main menu. If you're following the series directly, you probably have everything I have. I just went ahead and added online above the practice button because it seemed natural to me to add it there, but it is up to you. You can put it wherever you want. As usual for these menu episodes, I will show you everything that I have for my settings. So I have my positions here, my size here, and then I have my normal button that I use. It's an image that I use for all my buttons. 
I've called this online mode button and it is a variable. Then additionally, I have text within that button, which looks like this. The text says online. And there's the settings for my text. You can copy any of your other buttons and just replace the words. So instead of verses, say online if you want. That's what I did because it's the easiest. But it is up to you. Additionally, my positions may have changed for practice mode and below. So you can take a look at all my positions here. I will quickly go through them. You can pause them and copy them if you want to do a direct copy. But I would recommend you set this up however you want it because there's a very good chance you can make your game look nicer than what I have here in this template. Now, additionally, I've added two other buttons that kind of pop out here of the online mode. You can position these wherever you want, or you could go to a different screen that has the host and join button. That's entirely up to you. I have this little thing that I call a sub menu, but basically it is a menu that pops out that has the host and join buttons. So first things first, I've made another button that's called the host game button that is a variable. Here are my parameters and all my details. Notice that on the host and join or any of the sub menu buttons, I actually start them as hidden in the visibility. So they are not seen by default. This is because I actually want them to pop out of the online button or like from behind these buttons. So what I do is I actually have them animate and kind of scroll over or move over. But I put them out here so that you can see what they look like in the designer view without actually having to play the game. But I don't want them to be seen at the start of the game because otherwise it would be a little bit weird. So I have the host button as hidden. You've already seen the other details in here. And here's my join button. And the visibility on that is also hidden. Again, this is called join game button and it is a variable. Now lastly, I will show you the text that I have on here. So I have my host button text. It just says host. And then join button text is here. It just says join. All right, and that's everything. That's everything I've added on the designer view. Now we have a lot to do in the graph, but first things first, let's get our online button working and you able to navigate over it when you're playing the game. So go into the graph and we're gonna do our standard logic that we always do when we're adding a new button to this menu. I've shown a lot of different menu navigation methods, so I'm gonna keep using the one that works for the main menu, but you can use any of the ones I've shown in the series or a custom one, it doesn't matter. We're gonna to go to our variable called max selections. And now max selections is how many selections we have. And to this point, we've only had vertical movement and so we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so previously, max selections had a default value of eight. Since I've added the online button, max selections now needs to be nine because we've added a new value in here. So update your max selections and then go into your move selection border and there is some new stuff in here that I'll be going over in a few minutes. But before we get into that, like I said, let's just get our online button working. So in move selection border, we have this section that is a little bit outdated. And some of my other menus that I've gone over, I've cleaned it up quite a bit. But I'm going to keep using this for now since it doesn't need to change. It's just a little ugly to add to it. In move selection border, we have this switch on int. And what it does is whatever item we're on, whatever button we're on, on the menu, we want to highlight it. We want to show to the user that we are currently hovering over that button. Well, we need to add an entry for the online mode button, and we also need to put it where we actually want it to be on the menu. So on the switch on int, which takes in the selection that is passed in the move selection border, I've pressed add pin to make it go from zero to eight instead of zero to seven, which is how many entries I had before. Zero through seven is eight entries, but zero through eight is nine entries. So now we have nine entries as we discovered by the max selections variable. And so what I do is just copy this and paste it and change the button, but I'll go over it again since it's been a while since we've edited this. 
Essentially, each index represents one of these buttons on the screen, and it goes from top to bottom. So index 0 is Story, index 1 is Arcade, 2 is Versus, 3 is Now Online, 4 is Practice, 5 is Settings, 6 is Store, 7 is Credits, 8 is Quit. So following that, you can see I have Story Mode button at index 0, Arcade Mode button at index 1, Versus Mode button at index 2, and now where practice mode button was, I'm going to add a new one and put in the online mode button. I'm going to move everything over to one higher index. I go from index three on the switch, which is this one right here. And I just follow this line along and it goes into this node here. So what I've actually done, assuming you don't want to copy it from your other examples, is I've grabbed my online mode button and I got it. Then after I have gotten it, I type set style and I get this set style that is under variables appearance. Then I right click on the widget style and split it. And this will give me all the different variables underneath of the widget style. And the one we actually care about since we're not using the built-in menu navigation for the time being is the widget style normal. So we right click on that and split that. Then we get this huge thing. And what I want to do is select the widget style normal image. And I want it to be my highlighted image, which for me is BTN P1 hover bear one. So button player one hover variation one. And you can see that's what it is. That's what it is for all of my buttons. I also tend to draw the widget style normal draw as as a box because I think it looks better for me, but that is not required. That is up to your images and your game. Long story short, once I have this in here, the online mode button when navigated to can now be highlighted. But there's another thing we have to do. We have to clear our past selections. And essentially clear past selections just gets rid of all the other buttons that have been navigated to. So if I disconnect this, when I go down to the online button, you'll see versus did not go away. Versus did not clear. If I go to a different button, it does. But anytime I'm navigating to online, the button that I was on before won't clear if we don't clear our past selections. So this is just useful for making sure that only the button we're interested in is highlighted at the current time. All right, now once we've done this, let's go into clear past selections. And this has also changed a little bit. This is another function that's quite outdated because some of the newer menus do it a lot better. But this still works, just a little bit slow of a process. So if you haven't converted it over and you're like me, then what you need to do is just follow this along. All the logic is the same. We basically check to see if the current selection the player is on is equal to this value. If it's not equal to this value, we then clear that. We don't set it to the hover, we set it to the standard button. The buttons that we see here, the gray ones, are the ones that aren't hovered. The blue one is the hovered one. So we just set the button back to the standard gray style. And again, this is more of a manual process on this widget. So you can see I've done it for all these selections. And what I want to do is add a new selection now. I want to just copy this logic basically and add another index because before I had index 0 through 7, 8 items, but now we have 9. So we should go 0 through 8. So we want to make sure we continue the logic off the last one. We want to grab our current P1 selection and make sure it's not equal to our newest index, which is 8. Simply put, current P1 selection, get it, not equal, integer, or exclamation mark equal. Put in your newest index, which is 8. Drag off of this, put it into a branch. And then you drag off true, because only if it's not equal to this value do we want to reset it. And we're going to do clear selection 9. But you won't actually have this, because this is another one that I have to make. Now, thankfully, because I have wisened up over the tutorials, I actually made a new function or a new event today called clear selection that takes in a button. So you don't have to keep making these custom events every time you do this. But it's okay if you want to keep doing it. Again, it's not really a problem. It doesn't 
cause any performance issues or anything like that. It's just a little bit uglier, and I try to stay away from that. I try to make it as convenient as possible for you. But earlier in the series, we were using an event for each one, so it was clear selection with a number, and then it took the story mode button, and we did the same node we were doing in move selection border, but instead of using the hovered button, we were using button var 1, which is that gray button that we see on the designer view. So that's all we're doing. We're just resetting the style to the gray button. Well, of course, just like in move selection border, the online mode button is now the fourth selection. Remember, it's index three because zero, one, two, three. Since we start at index zero, this is actually the fourth selection. You can see it's the fourth button from the top. One, two, three, four. So what I've done is I've added a new event so right click, add custom event, and then when you do this, you can call it whatever you want. So if you're following that old method, you can do what I did and say clear selection nine, because that will be the newest one. I have already made one below, so I'll just put 10 as an example. But I made clear selection nine, and then I moved everything over past the versus menu. So the practice menu that was previously on clear selection four, I moved that to clear selection five and so on and so forth. So you can see clear selection five, which we already had was the settings button, but now I've changed it to be the practice button. Clear selection six was the store button, but now I've changed it to be the settings button. Clear selection seven was the credits button, but now I've changed it to be the store button. Clear selection eight was the quit button, but now I've changed it to be the credits button. And lastly, clear selection nine didn't exist, so we're making that the quit button. The reason for all this is so that on clear selection four, where our online mode button is now, we can pass that in so we can clear the right selection. Now, this method is very busy, okay? It's not too bad because once you do it once, you can keep following that method. But I've added a new method from one of my other widgets that I'll show you today, which is gonna make our lives a lot easier going forward, and you can feel free to adopt it if you want. I'm not gonna show it right now. I mean, you can see it right now. I'm not gonna talk about it right now because we'll talk about it in a little bit when we get into that. So going back to clear past selections, make sure you call clear selection nine. And once you do this, you will now be able to navigate to your online mode button. So you should be able to do this at this point. Perfect. Now, what we want to do is when we select the online mode, we want to have a little pop out for host and join. And if we press back, the menu should close and then we should be able to navigate freely through this menu. So there we go. You can do that. Notice when I open this menu, the online button stays highlighted, but I can actually navigate between the host and the join buttons. That's what we want. This is a sub menu, and this will allow us to actually get into our networking mechanics when we do that in the next episode. So we need our host and we need our join button, and we need them to pop out so the player can visualize them. Let's close this now, and let's work on this. So first things first, let's make an animation for the host and the join buttons. You don't have to do this. Again, it is up to you how you design your widget. But we need some way to access the host and the join buttons. I thought the little submenu pop out was a pretty cool method, so I'm going to show that one off. Now, when you are in the designer view here, you will have an animations tab. You may not have that tab. If you don't have that tab, you can go to window and scroll down to animations right here and select that and it will pop up somewhere on your screen. From here, what you can do is create widget animations. So create little 2D animations and it does most of the work for you in terms of the time scale and implementing it properly with what you tell it to do. So if I tell it to move a certain amount of units, it will move a certain amount of units. It's that simple. So I've made a new animation which you can do by pressing plus animation. However, I don't need a new one now, so I'll just go over the one I've already created with you. If you right click on the animation that gets created, you can rename it, and I called it Sub Menu Extend, because that's what brings the menu out. The menu does technically go back in as well, but I'm actually just playing the animation in reverse. You could play a different animation or create a different animation for putting it in reverse, but you don't have to. Once you've made an animation, you have these things called tracks on this timeline. Again, if for some reason you don't have the timeline on your widget, you can go to window and select timeline. 
Now, the timeline is very self-explanatory. It is quite literally a little graph of times. So you can see this is zero seconds, this is 0.25 seconds, 0.5 seconds, 0.75 seconds, and this is one second. So it just keeps track how much time has passed. What we can do is add tracks, so we can add one for the host game button, one for the join game button, and one for any of our other submenus that need to extend, and we can move them based on this timeline. So the plus track button, you can go ahead and select this, and then you may have some options that pop up above mine. So I have all named widgets here. You might see your host game button and your join game button already, because you can only have one track per animation for these when pressing the plus track button. So since I already have my host game button, join game button, you won't see them here, but you might see them on yours. If you don't, it's fine. You can go to all name widgets and then you can find your join game button and your host game button. You can technically use this canvas panel slot one that you see that will work too, but there will also be one that just says host game button and join game button. Again, you can't see it on mine because I already have them as tracks. So once you add them, you should see them and they look like this. Basically what we want to do is move them out, right? We want to extend them from the current menu. Now they're already in the proper place to visualize them, right? Host is already next to online and join is right below host. But I want them to move out from that menu. So what I've done is added a new track onto my host game button by pressing plus track here. So you have your track to get your actual element that you're moving, and then you have your track on that element, which will let you add things like these different properties. So I've already added a transform, and I'll show you that. So once you add a transform, it's gonna look like this. You'll have your element, the host game button, and then you'll have your property, which for me is transform. Now, if you open transform up, you'll see even more parameters. We don't need all of these parameters. For me, I just need to move it on the X value. So typically what I do is I start at the zero second mark on the timeline. You can drag this little red marker that you see my mouse is on to move where you're at on the timeline. I go to the zero second mark because that's the current time. And I press the little plus sign right here on the property that I want to change. You can technically press the plus sign on the entire transform property, but if you do, it adds keyframes for all of these properties. So the rotation, the scale, the shear, we don't need to track all that. We actually only need the translation X. So I press the one next to translation X and it says add a new key at the current time. When you do this, you will get a little red circle here at the time that you're on, which is zero seconds for me. Then typically what I do is I scroll to the time on the timeline and that is how long I want the animation to be. So I decided the extend and also the pull back in. So the host menu, the host button going from inside the other menus to fully extended and then retracting is one second long. I go to the one second mark on my timeline and I add another key. At this point, you won't see anything happening, but you should have two red circles on your timeline. Now it's very simple with what we need to do. So we want to line up our buttons so that they are in the exact spot that we expect them to be. So you've seen it like this because I manually put my host and join buttons out here so you can visualize them. But at zero seconds of the animation, I want them to start within the online and practice mode buttons. So I move my translation X to whatever value it is that I choose. Now, I already know from just doing it that my value that I want to use is negative 280 at zero seconds. This is where it is completely hidden by the online button it is perfectly behind it. But you might have to play around with this value. You can literally click and drag it or you can try typing in different numbers and see how it works out. It's super simple to play around with. But as you move it, you should see the host button move. Now you can either just edit this value here or you can manually click on the key and edit the value with that key selected. This is what I typically do so I know exactly what I'm working on. So at zero seconds, I have a translation X of negative 280. Then I click on my other key value 
and I put a value of zero because I'd already put the host button where I want it to be. So those are my values. I have zero at one second and negative 280 at zero seconds. It will do the rest. Every interval in between it is doing automatically to get the desired result. Now it might have been a little bit complicated if that was the first time you saw it, but really it's quite simple and I think once you play around with it, it will make a lot of sense. Now I have the join game button which does exactly the same thing, so I'm not really going to go into it in depth. But you can see at 0 seconds I use negative 280 on this key, but at 1 second and this key I use 0. And you can see both the host and the join buttons pop out and go back in as they should. So now we have our animations set up and we can actually play these animations. Once we play these animations, we can now access these buttons so the player can actually navigate to the correct spot. So if we now go to our graph, where we want to go is the confirm selection function that we have. Again, a few things have changed in here, but don't worry too much about that right now. We're going to focus on the switch on int again. So just like in the move selection border, we now have a new index we have to account for because we only had 0 through 7 before. And since we've added one, we now need to go through 0 through 8. You're probably familiar with that by now. But anyway, long story short, just like before on the move selection border, the index that we care about is this new online button. And that as an index 0, 1, 2, and 3. So index 3 is the index we care about. So I've moved all my other values down. So index four is now the practice menu logic. You can tell because I'm setting the game mode to practice. Index five is my settings menu logic. You can tell because I'm spawning the settings screen. Six is the store. You can tell I'm spawning the store. Seven is the credits. I'm spawning the credits. And eight is the quick game, which you can tell because I am spawning the exit game pop up. So index three here is the one that we care about for today's episode. Now in here, what we want to do is open up the online sub menu if it's not already open. And to do that, I've just added a new Boolean. So add a new variable that is of a Boolean type and I've called it is online sub menu open. It will be false by default. So you don't have to worry about changing this. Now, once we press the confirm button on the online button, we should open up this menu if it's not already open. So I'm grabbing my is online submenu open and getting it. Then I'm dragging off of that and typing not Boolean. So basically if it's not open, then go into this branch. If this returns true, this means it is not currently open, in which case we want to go and open it. So that's what this is doing. It's false by default, so it won't be open initially, which means this branch will return true. Then I set my two buttons to be visible and start playing the animation. Now you'll notice here, I actually plug both my host game button and join game button into the set visibility node. You're allowed to do that, which is a nifty little thing. You can make several things visible at the same time. But we want to grab our host game button and our join game button. And we want to call set visibility and we want to make sure that we pass in both the host game button and the join game button. Or do two separate set visibilities. One with the host, one with the join. That works too. And make sure that the invisibility is visible. That way we can see them. Because remember they default to be invisible. And in which case we don't want them to not be able to see the animation that's playing. So now they are visible, we want to go ahead and play the animation. This will happen so quickly you won't notice any sort of flicker or anything. But if you do want to play the animation first and then immediately after set the visibility to be visible, that's fine too. It will work the same either way. Now what we want to do is actually play the animation that we just created. So in your variables list, you will now have an animations category here. You can open it up and you'll find your animation. My submenu extend is my animation that I made in the designer view. And so I can drag off my submenu extend and get it. Then I can pull off that and type play animation. And you can do play animation forward and reverse if you want or the standard play animation. It really doesn't matter. All of these can accomplish what we need. So I have play animation and I've left everything the same for this one. 
you can change anything if you want to or need to, but I didn't need to. I made the animation exactly how I wanted it to play going forward. Then at this point, since the animation is played, I'm going to mark the online submenu as open. So now I'm setting our online submenu as checked or as true because the menu is open. This also means we can't spam the confirm button and keep playing the animation. So actually, if you do right now, it's going to bring me the character select because I haven't set up the host in the join yet. But you won't be able to spam the online button and keep playing the animation. So that's a good thing. Next thing we want to do is actually reset our current P1 selection. It's a little bit strange because we aren't at index zero in our normal list, but the online mode and any other sub menus, I'm going to have a new list for them, a new set of buttons that they can navigate through. This is the simplest way to handle this in my opinion, because you have a certain max number of elements and you start from zero and you can navigate through them. It doesn't make it any more complicated than our already existing logic and now we can actually do that for any sub menus that we have so i set my current p1 selection back to index zero this way we start at the first index in the sub menu which will be the host game button to do this it's really simple just set current p1 selection and leave it at zero from a visual standpoint, I also like the idea of automatically highlighting the host game button so the player knows that they are on that button once the pop out has come out. So I've gone ahead and called move selection border, not playing the sound effect because it's not required. Notice that confirm button already plays a sound effect, so we'll already hear that one. We don't need the moving one to play. And then I will leave the selection at zero because we don't actually want to move the index at all. We just want to highlight the one that is already present, which will be the host game button. Now, once we've done this, we should be able to see our menu pop out. It won't work exactly like we want right now because we need to go edit, move selection border, and clear past selections to account for them. But let's take a quick break from that and go into move selection first because we only want to navigate between the buttons that we have in our sub menu. So previously in move selection, we were checking to see if the settings menu was open or the quick game pop-up was up. And if they were, we weren't doing any of our logic on the main menu screen. But if they weren't, we were then doing our standard navigation logic. Well, I've gone ahead and copied that logic and pasted it down below. And we want to do the same thing that we were already doing there because our navigation is perfect. We don't have to change it. But we do have to change the max number of selections that we can navigate through because max selections is nine, but we don't have nine selections in our sub menu for the online mode. We only have two. We have the host and the join. So I add another check in here after the first branch, but before we start modifying our current P1 selection. And I just check to see if our online sub menu is open or not. So I get online sub menu open not boolean and then we drag off that and go into a branch now if it's not open we can do our standard navigation logic so we go into this branch and then we go into our standard logic that we've had for many many episodes but if this branch returns false that means that the online submenu is open in which case we have to set a new maximum value to be able to navigate through we don't want to still have max selections as nine so I've added another variable here. So you can press plus variable, make an integer, and I've called this one max selections in online submenu. So it's the same exact premise. I am still manually setting the number of selections that we have, but I'm setting it based on the number of selections in the current menu that I'm in. If you plan on having a lot of submenus, I'd recommend making an array, and then you could access the correct index in the array, which will have how many selections you have quite like how we did it in the store widget but for me right now the only one i'm going to need is the online sub menu so i'm fine with a standard integer now after i make this variable and give it a name compile and you can set the default value for me i want to set two as the default value because i have the host button and the join button so one and two or index zero and index one the other logic in the move selection for this path is exactly the same. The only thing we're changing is this max selections and online submenu. So just take 
this value, get it, and pass it into this less than check. That is our bounds check. Instead of using the max selections, we'll use this new variable we made. Move selection will now work for the regular navigation or the submenu. Both are perfect. All right, next place we want to go is move selection border because that is called at the end of this logic and also initially when we press confirm on the online mode button. Now, remember I said to ignore this section earlier. We are going to cover this now. So when we come into move selection border, we're checking to see if we should play a sound effect and then playing it or skipping it. That's not going to change, obviously. But after that, we were immediately going into the switch statement and then selecting the button that should be considered hovered that way we can appropriately highlight it and make it that blue color however we actually don't want to do that for all of our standard buttons anymore when we're in the sub menu we only want to worry about the other buttons that are in that sub menu so i do the same check that we just did to move selection or i check to see if the online sub menu is open if it's not open okay online sub menu not True means it's not open. If it's not open, we do our standard logic that we were already doing. But if this branch returns false, we do new logic, and this is the logic for the submenu. Notice that I still use the same selection index coming in from the function as an input parameter. So what was going into the other switch statement is going to go into this switch statement as well. But I only need two entries in this. I don't need nine. So I do switch on int, and I add two pins, passing in that index. Now once you do this, we only have two buttons, so you can copy the logic from above if you want, and just change the buttons, or just make your own. It won't take very long since there's only two. So I grab my host game button, and then I get my set style. And you know where to go from here because we've done it. So you just split this and split it again. And I set my hovered or my blue variation right here. Then I call clear pass selections. If the index is index one, that is the bottom of the two, that is the join game button. So instead of using the host game button, I'm going to use the join game button. And I'm going to set the style on that to be the blue. And I'm going to clear the past selections. Now, this will work. This will actually make it so the submenus can be fully highlighted and navigated to. But there's going to be a little bug if we don't address it in the clear past selections. Because now we're not clearing the host button or the join game button. So as we navigate, they're still going to be highlighted just like the regular menu was. So now we can go into clear past selections and you guessed it. We're going to add that same check that we've added to move selection and move selection border. So we're going to check to see if the online sub menu is open. And if it's not open, then we're going to do our standard logic that we've been doing and that we just added to earlier in the episode when we added the online button. But if it is in fact open, we want to do our own logic. So remember, if it's not open, this branch is true. But if it's open, this branch returns false. And so in here, we want to do the same logic, but we want to use different buttons. We want to use the host game button and the join game button. So you can start off by either copying the logic from the normal navigation or again, just typing it out. It'll be very quick since there's only two of them. So we want our current P1 selection. Then we want to check and make sure it's not equal to index zero. Remember, it's not a new index. We're using index zero because when we're in the sub menu, host button is index zero, join button is index one. Bring this into a branch. And then you could make clear selection 10 and clear selection 11, or you can make it a little bit easier to use instead of continuing to make new events every time. So what I've done is gone into my event graph and I've made this function that I kind of spoke about at the start of the episode, but didn't explain. So here is my clear selection event. So right click, add custom event. And this is just like any of the other clear selections. But the difference with this one is that I actually have an input parameter here. So if you click on an event after you make it, you can add an input parameter just like you can with any function. So I've added one of type button. 
So you can search for button and get the object reference of a button. And I've called that parameter button to clear. Then I do the same node that you see us do in all these other clear selection events, but we can use the same event for every button because what we're clearing is the button that gets passed into this event. So going back to clear pass selections now, if instead of using clear selection with a number, I just call this new clear selection function, I have this button to clear parameter and I can just pass in the button that I actually want to revert back to the default value. So in this case, I'm going to take my host game button and pass it into button to clear on my clear selection event. Then in my next iteration where I'm checking to see if the join game button is highlighted or not, then I call clear selection, but pass join game button in and see, we don't have to make these new clear selection one, two, three for all these. We can use the same event for all of them. So if you'd like, you can go through all of these and change these out and just use the regular clear selection event, passing in the appropriate button for each. It's not required. As you can see, I don't do it here just for the proof of concept for the tutorial, but you can feel free to do it if you would like. It will be a little bit cleaner and you won't have to keep making new events every time you want to add to this screen. But now at this point, your menu should pretty much work entirely. There's one final thing we need to do. So once we bring this menu out, you can see I can navigate through it. I can go from host to join and join to host, and I can't go out of bounds anywhere. I can only have these two options. But we sometimes may make a mistake and we don't want to actually go to online. So when we press back, we should return to the regular menu, in which case we want to be able to navigate through the regular options again freely. So to do this, we need to go to the event graph of the main menu screen. And we need to go to our listeners up in event construct. So I have some listeners in here that listen for certain input actions. And when they are pressed, we call certain functions. We have this for almost all of our menus and the main menu is no different, but we never had a back on it. So we had up, down and confirm. I've added the return as well. This way we can actually do some different logic when we press return. So first things first, get your listen for input action and you will have to put in an action name. I have return P1 that I've used for other widgets, but essentially you need an input action in your project settings. So if you go edit project settings input, you'll see that I have return P1, which is either backspace on a keyboard or gamepad face button right on a controller, which is the B button on an Xbox controller. So when one of those buttons is pressed, because of the event type pressed, we will then call this event. So what I've done is added that return P1 and then called my event return P1. Now I don't have the ability to go back to the splash screen. It's actually a design choice. It would be very easy to do. You could just, if they press return P1 and they're not in the online sub menu, spawn the splash screen and remove the main menu. But I don't have the ability to do that right now. So I'm intentionally ignoring that. However, if the online submenu is open, I'm going to retract the submenu options, say that the submenu is not open anymore, and I'm going to play a sound effect because that's just a nice little cue for the player to say that it has been done. So off this event, check if your online submenu is open. You'll notice this time I'm not using the not boolean, it's just if it's open or not. Bring it into the branch. And if it's true that it is open, we want to grab our animation sub menu extend, and I'm going to grab the regular play animation note again, but this time I am going to change the play mode to be reverse as you can see here. So we have forward reverse and ping pong ping pong, by the way, is just back and forth. So it'll play to completion forward and then it will play to completion reverse and then it will play to completion forward and it will just keep looping. We want reverse because we just want to play it once backward. Then I want to set the is online submenu open because this has closed the submenu. So it's no longer open. So we want to set it back to false by leaving it unchecked. 
Then we want to play sound 2D, and I'm playing my standard back sound. This is the sound effect that I use on all my widgets when we return or press the back button. So play sound 2D, and then just find a sound asset that works for you, or use a common one like I always do, where it's the same for every time you press that button. All right, now at this point, you will be able to go online and then press the back button. Go online, press the back button, just like that. However, you'll notice if you don't do this one thing that I'm going to show you before we wrap up the episode, you will start back on something like the arcade or the host game button. Why is that? Well, we changed our current P1 selection in here. So when we exit this little sub menu, we need to put it back to the online mode button. Otherwise, we're going to stay on the same index we were on, which doesn't really apply to the standard navigation we used. So when we press return P1 here, there's one final thing we need to do. Since I am specifically checking for the online sub menu here, I know that I'm exiting from the online sub menu, in which case I know exactly what I need to set current P1 selection to. If you have other sub menus that you implement, you have to make sure you are returning from the right one. So once you're returning from that one that you know of, so it's online, we know that this is index three, because index zero, index one, index two, index three, we know we should set the current P1 selection back to index three. So now if you do it, doesn't matter which one I press back if I'm on host or join. When I press back, I will be on online, so it will be seamless. Now, you can also press open and close pretty rapidly. And if you do it before the menu is open or closed, you might get a little weird visual bug because it's still opening. But then it snaps to the closing animation. That's perfectly fine for me. I really don't mind. But if you want to adjust that, you could make sure that the animation is finished playing before listening for this input. So if you take your animation here, sub menu extend, you could check to see if the animation is playing or not. And if it is playing, don't do this logic. So it won't let you return or it won't let you confirm while the animation is playing. Again, doesn't matter to me. I prefer having the speed on the menu so that the player can go where they, they need to go but it does look a little bit better to have that in there. So that's a choice you will have to make. But with all of that said, guys, you should now have a fully functional pop-out menu or a little sub-menu for your online mode, in which case we will now be able to use to test our online mechanics. But that's all I got for you today, guys. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe and feel free to check out the Patreon page that I have if you want to give me some extra support. For those of you that have supported me on Patreon and YouTube membership, thank you guys so much. You guys help keep this series alive and bring out all these new, exciting mechanics and systems that we're implementing. So thank you so, so much for all of that. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. It is completely free, and we would be happy to help you out. But with all that said, guys, I am Sean the Bro. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.